All right, let's st start with this concept of a bridge. Oh boy. Okay, it's working now. Jesus uh, ministry uh, became a bridge that existed between heaven and earth. And he set down that as an example for us that we're supposed to be bridges. So as we think about the physical and mental and social concerns and the needs that people have in those, in those categories, we can be a bridge between those needs that they have and what may not rise to the surface for them as their spiritual needs. So as we care for them, as we minister to them for their physical, mental, and social needs, that can become a bridge that can help them to recognize and be able to communicate about their spiritual concerns. Does that make sense? Go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like to share. It makes sense. I think the the uh, time that underlined that the most for me was in the fall of 1999. We were living in Eastern North Carolina. And in the span of just a little under, I think it was 10 days, we had 36 inches of rain from three different hurricanes. And after the last, a few days after the last hurricane, we began to hear about helicopters rescuing people from roofs and, and people in dire distress and, and you know, all kinds of problems. And it just got worse and worse and worse. And uh, our church mobilized to uh, put together a large warehouse and we were distributing all kinds of things to people that, uh, that were in need. And then we started realizing, well, there's people that are are stuck and they can't, you know, maybe their car has been damaged or whatever, and they can't even get to us to get their needs supplied. So the men of the church started loading up trailers and trucks and we go out into the, the, the small villages and, and towns that uh, have been hit hard where people were isolated. We just started delivering goods to people. And what we found is that that opened people up to that ministering to their physical needs opened up the people to us being able to minister to their spiritual needs. And uh, for me, while I mentally, I think I understood that, um, I didn't really understand it to its fullest extent until I had gone through that experience. Anybody else have an experience like that where ministering to someone's physical needs open that person up to you being able to minister to their spiritual needs? All right, well, being there's no comments on that, let me take that to uh, another little illustration that I, I kind of pointed out, I think in our second night, but I never really put the slide up. So let me spend a little more time on that. This uh, concept comes from Mark Finley, where we're sh we should be looking at people's spiritual interest maybe as a scale. And he suggests that we look at it as numbers from one to 10. And that would go from somebody with no spiritual interest up into somebody that is completely surrendered to Christ. And then a, a scale of people in between. Uh, so let's think about that with some Bible examples. How about the, the Roman centurion presiding over the crucifixion? Where would we put him on that scale? Oh, well, we might find him as a one, somebody with no spiritual interest. So in terms of a, an objective in working with that person, 
what would be our objective? Just simply moving them up the scale. You're probably not going to want to seek to take them to a 10 because that's probably not going to work. But what if you moved him from being a one to a two? That maybe he now acknowledges that God exists as a personal God or as a loving God. That would be quite a big, uh, big change from somebody that had absolutely no spiritual interest. Another example, uh, Nicodemus. When he came to Christ, maybe we could say that he was a seven. But after his interview, maybe he was moved to eight. And then after the cross, we see him as a 10. And he became very instrumental and effective in helping the church to grow uh, because of his leadership capabilities, because of his financial capacities, and because of his commitment to Christ. <clears throat> Another example, uh, the average of people today. We'd probably say, if we had to average people here in the United States, it may be below seven. Now, there's certainly ones and there's certainly tens and there's people everywhere in between. But if you were just to take an average, you know, maybe it'd be seven. So if you were to minister some, to somebody that's a seven and, you, in, in, and uh, the Holy Spirit used you to move them to an eight, would that not be a success? Certainly it would. So using this concept of the bridge, how can we apply that in our cycle of evangelism? Well, you need to have a plurality of different kinds of, of uh, outreach efforts. You need things that can reach the heart of people who are seekers, but also people that have little spiritual interest. Um, now you're not going to probably see the people that have little spiritual interest as moving right directly into a Bible study uh, or going directly into baptism or coming to one of your evangelistic outreaches. But if you can uh, lower their prejudices and you can get them to, to be thinking about their spiritual needs, that's, that's really a worthy objective. So you need a variety of outreach activities. Uh, you want to move people through these, uh, by these activities from where they are to a higher number, step by step. And Bible studies, uh, generally, you're not going to be able to engage somebody into a Bible study unless they are at a level of seven or higher on the scale. So we are bridges, and we should incorporate bridging strategies and bridging um, activities bridging ministries into our cycle of evangelism. So Stephen, can I share something there? Absolutely, please do. Uh, can you go back to that one slide? Uh, Cause I like that. I, 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 uh, I can appreciate this slide. Yeah, this one right here. You know, uh, in my, in my uh, uh, field of work, I, I uh, um, do health assessments for new employees coming into Emory. And I had uh, one occasion, a young lady that came in and um, the way she dressed uh, was very revealing. Um, she had a seductive clothing and that kind of thing. Uh, on her health questionnaire, she indicated that her mental health was poor. And um, so I asked her if she could just uh, share a little bit about why she rated herself poor. And she said she was starting a new life. She's moving into the area, starting a new life. And after talking to her, um, come to find out that uh, she was uh, in, in uh, for all intent and purposes, running away from where she was to start this new life because she was abused by relatives where she was before. And uh, the reason why she was dressed the way she was is because they convinced her somehow that that was the way she was supposed to look. Uh, so after talking with her and uh, letting her know that she was better than that, uh, we, the conversation moved into you are a valuable person in the, in the eyes of God. And, um, and just kind of building on that. And she went, I believe, um, from maybe a two or three to someone who asked, what church do you go to? Uh, I wanna start going to church now. I thought that was kind of cool. And, and I could see how that, how that uh, 
can, can fit on this uh, with this bridge concept. Wow, thanks for sharing that. that. That's a powerful example of just this very idea. I think so often, I, I think the, the, the value in looking at the process in this way is that so often we just, we kind of, people get frustrated when they're not able to get people to attend uh, when they minister to them. And, and so this, this concept, I think, just kind of helps to realize that, that no matter what we do, even if we warn people and they make no response to it, that's still part of God's work. I mean, think of the work of Noah. He spent every single dime that he had on that, on that ark. When he got into the ark, the only thing he took with us with him were his family members. He didn't bring his cash or his gold or his belongings with him. He just he you know he spent it all building the ark, and he spent 120 years as an evangelist, and he didn't have a single convert. But he was still doing exactly what God told him to do. And he and God was using him to affect. So how do we build these bridges? Well, there's lots of different ways. Uh, you know, you can make your own list here. I, I made a short list. But all of these things are bridge building activities. Uh, for example, um, do we not have a lot of people now that are unemployed, especially as a result of the pandemic. In our particular church, we've got a lot of entrepreneurial people and small business owners. And so I was thinking a great way to minister to them might be to have a seminar on how to create your own job. Uh, subtitle it, you know, build, uh, opening your own business. And maybe it's a five night series and you have five different people from the congregation that are business entrepreneurs and they make presentations uh, that help people understand the process of building their own business. And then you tell the people that if they attend every one of the classes, then they get a free one hour consultation with any one of the presenters of their choice. Uh, well, think about how doing something like that can help build bridges with people. You've got a presenter now that's having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a person. They, they're seeing it as a kind of a gift and, or a freebie or a special reward for them for attendance. Um, but it gets that person into a more intimate, uh, uh, the possibility of a more intimate relationship with the person that's... Uh, that's giving them the business tips and so forth. And it might result in a long-term friendship. And then that friendship could result in that person being moved up the scale over a period of time. So I just, I just really like that idea. And I appreciate Mark Finley sharing that uh, with, with us and not, not being bothered by me using his idea. So how do we qualify people for Bible studies? Well, we do that according to uh, Matthew 7, by being fruit inspectors. Well, <clears throat> Matthew 7, verses 16 and 17 says, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. So in the same passage earlier in the chapter, in, in, in chapter 7, it says that we're not to judge uh, because <laughs> with whatever harshness we judge other people, it's going to come back upon us. So it says not to judge, but in the same passage, it says for us to judge. So how are we to understand that? Well, early in the, in the chapter, it's talking about we're not to be condemning people. We're not supposed to be guessing at their motives, things like that. But it says that we can look at them and see in their lives what kind of a tree they are by the fruit of their life. And that's what we should be doing in terms of trying to qualify people for Bible studies. We should be fruit inspectors so they kind of know where they're at. Uh, so how would we differentiate ripe fruit from green fruit? Well, 
here's some examples of what you know, what you might uh, be able to observe in terms of right proof. People that are manifesting an earnest desire to seek and find Bible truth. Uh, they accept Bible studies or they've completed Bible courses. They're lonely, unhappy, dissatisfied with their lives. They visit or attend your church regularly. They speak favorably of your church and its services. They accept major doctrines and make positive decisions. Are these green fruit or ripe fruit? Well, these are definitely ripe fruit. They display signs they're under conviction. They're dissatisfied with their church. They don't, or they don't belong to a church, or they're maybe the, uh, they're a backslider. Um, there's been evidence of a change in their lifestyle as they've learned truth. And they demonstrate a desire to share with others what they've learned. Now, in opposition, what would be, or in contrast, what would be examples of green fruit? Well, people that talk despairing, uh, despairingly uh, about, I think that's supposed to be disparagingly about your church, refuse Bible studies. Uh, they do not accept clear teachings of scripture. They're deeply involved and strongly committed to their own church. Uh, they won't make commitments. That's green fruit. So uh, anybody have any questions about that? That little uh, that little module so far before we go into the next one, uh, Stephen. I, I think um, can you elaborate just quickly again um, about the green fruit because I sometimes it we we might have a tendency to spend more time than we should on green fruit. What do, what do you think? I think green fruit is worthy of our time, but not worthy of of inappropriate efforts like a green fruit, you wouldn't want to try to engage them in a Bible study. You don't want to try to constantly engage them in spiritual discussions. Um, but you can be friends with them. You can try to befriend them. You can uh, identify if they have physical needs that are not being met. Um, so in that sense, I think, uh, you know, we don't want to consider them unworthy of our time. But uh, but it's more a concept of differentiating the type of effort you apply toward them. At least that's that's the way I I look at it. Uh, what do you think, Mick? Yeah, I, I I agree with you. The the amount of effort or the type of effort. Yeah, I think you're right on. Right. All right. And who are called to make disciples? Well, the Savior's commission to the disciples included all the believers. It includes all believers in Christ to the end of time. So are any of you excluded from the Savior's commission? No, we're all included. And it's a fatal mistake to suppose that the work of saving souls depends alone on the ordained minister. All to whom the heavenly inspiration has come are put in trust with the gospel. All who receive the life of Christ are ordained to work for the salvation of their fellow men. For this work, the church was established, and all who take upon themselves its sacred vows are thereby pledged to be co-workers with Christ. That's from the Desire of Ages 822. That's a real powerful quote, I thought. We're all ministers. And in fact, in all parts of the church where members think of themselves as ministers, the church is growing very rapidly. 60% of the baptisms in the Philippines are the result of laity. In East Africa and Mexico, where pastors have 20 to 30 churches, there's tremendous growth. Worldwide, as the pastor to member ratio increases, the growth rate drops. And this chart shows the truth of that. Uh, look at Europe, Japan, and North America, in contrast to East Africa, the Mexico U Union, and the South Philippine Union where you have one to 1,000 uh, pastor to member ratio, the growth rate is 12%. In Europe, where you have one to 169, the growth rate is 1.25%. That's an amazingly convincing chart, in my opinion. Now, one could argue that there's a difference between, you know, the, the wealthy nations and and those that are not so wealthy, and that maybe that has some explanation here, but I believe it has more to do with a church that doesn't see themselves as pastorally dependent. And in fact, when our church started, uh, Ellen White and the 
General Conference uh, president were both very much against settled what they called settled pastors. That means a pastor that was assigned to a single church or to a single church district. They saw uh, things to be uh, more like it was in the apostolic church. For example, Paul, he never was settled over a particular church. He would go into a new area, raise up a church, train uh, leadership, and then leave, periodically coming back to assess things. But, but uh, it, it wasn't a pastorally dependent uh, uh, church model. And the early Adventist church was the same way. And if you look at our growth, where we, where we were having the highest percentages of growth were during those days when we were not pastorally dependent. Unfortunately, when that general conference pastor uh, passed and Alan White passed, uh, there was a succumbing of the leadership to the, to the strong call that people wanted pastors over their churches. And as that began to happen, our growth rate started to sink. So if we're all being called, what happens when we don't heed the call? This is really powerful, I think. It says, when professed Christians, this is from Testimonies, Volume 6, page 424, when professed Christians feel no burden to enlighten those in darkness, they cease to impart grace and knowledge. They become less discerning. They lose their appreciation of the richness of the heavenly endowment. Because of neglected opportunities and abuse of privileges, the members of these churches are not growing in grace and in the, no and, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18. Therefore, they are weak in faith, deficient in knowledge, and children in experience. They are not rooted and grounded in the truth. If they remain thus, the many delusions of the last days will surely deceive them, for they will have no spiritual eyesight to distinguish truth from error. So what happens? Well, this is quite a long list of problems, but I don't think anyone would argue that we don't see these problems pretty prevalent in the church. Well, let's flip it around and say, well, what happens when we do heed the call? What happens when we do witness? What happens when we do uh, the work that God has called us to do. Well, we gain discernment. We appreciate the riches of heaven. We grow in grace and knowledge of Christ and strengthen in faith and gain in spiritual knowledge. We mature in our experience and become rooted and grounded in truth. And we're protected from the delusions of the last days. We gain spiritual eyesight to distinguish between truth and error. And we share in the joy of Jesus. Now, are those just... Uh, uh, an assembly of, of weird uh, uh, facts or are all these promises of what will happen when we witness? Sounded like somebody was getting ready to speak. Oh, that was me, honey. I just wanted to share a thought. Okay. Um, recently, and I was looking for the, the quote, but I couldn't find it, but I read it somewhere and I couldn't find it later. But anyway, we're told God tells us that the reason the light in the, the you know, the, the parable of the 10 virgins, that the reason the light in the 10 virgins want, uh, goes out is because of the lack of witnessing. And um, I thought, wow, wow, this is so essential for our salvation that we are sharing the truth that God has given us to with others. And if we're not actively doing that, our light will burn out. That's for sure. And we'll develop close friends as we witness. So why, why aren't we fulfilling the commission? Why aren't we heeding the call? Well, I think for a lot of people, it's simply fear. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, well, what are we afraid of? Or if we are participating, what are the other people that are not participating? What are they afraid of? Well, rejection probably heads the list. Uh, being made to look foolish, um, being fearful of ridicule, concerns about what other people think. Some people are afraid of shortchanging the cause of Christ because they feel like they don't know enough to share. Other people feel like I don't really have anything to offer. But as you look at a lot of these things on the list, what do we find as the common thread between them? Well, it's a focusing upon ourself, right? 
If we're focusing upon ourselves, what are we guilty of? It's really the, our, our only reasons are just plain selfishness. First John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not made perfect, who has, has not been made perfect in love. So if we're afraid to, uh, to really commit our life to a life of service for Christ, then we probably need to recognize that uh, we haven't probably gotten to the point where we have that perfect love uh, for Jesus yet. Uh, so that would be something to focus on. But I think what's true with this is, is uh, as it is true with so many other things, so often God uses an iterative <laughs> approach with us. As we apply ourselves, that results in us loving more. And as we love more, then we're more willing to apply ourselves, which results in us loving more. And we apply ourselves more. And he gives us more love. You get the point. Um, so a lot of times we just ha have to, even if there's defects in our heart, uh, it just needs to start, I think, often with an action. And then... The action is followed by the reaction of God. You know, we receive his grace in proportion to our faith. So what is it that can help to overcome fear? Well, what we just talked about, love for Jesus, but also love for the lost. And I think we need to plead for uh, a, a deep love for those that are lost and a, a zeal for their salvation. But training also helps to overcome fear. If you feel like you're better equipped, that helps you to be less fearful. But experience also. As we gain experience, we realize that we don't really have to know everything. Um, the, the knowing kind of comes from the experience. And you can't get the experience. You, you don't want to wait for the experience until you know everything. It kind of comes with the, in the process. And then also going with another like-minded person. Uh, say one person is, is at the door and conducting an interview, well, the other person can be pr in prayer. And, and you switch back and forth, and it really, 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 really helps. Uh, I personally have a hard time going up to the doors of people that I don't know. And it's that selfishness, you know, fear of rejection, uh, fear of uh, not knowing or, or whatever. Um, but my wife has no fear of that. So as we would go door to door, <laughs> I would usually ask her to do the first few houses. And as I saw that it wasn't as bad as I imagined it was going to be, you know, I would gain uh, more confidence to give it a try. And, and as you're doing it yourself, you find a joy in doing it. And that helps to overcome uh, the fears that you have. Now, when we talk about soul winning, Jesus used a couple of really powerful metaphors. Uh, can you think of any? Hint, hint, it's on the screen. Fishing and farming. All right. I will make you fishers of men. Why was he saying that to this group of fishermen? They already know how to fish. So then they would just transfer that method to going for people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. He was using something that they were familiar with as a metaphor for what he was going to teach them to do. They knew how to fish. And, and he's saying, well, I'm going to teach you how to be fishers of men. There were people that were farmers in the area. He said, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they are already white for, har for harvest. It's another metaphor, the farming metaphor. So let's think about that a little bit. What do you need for fishing? Well, we need fishing equipment. We need knowledge of fish. And we need a strategy and a technique. Well, let's think about the fishing equipment. What's our fishing equipment? We're fishing for people. Well, Bible studies. 
our Bible, maybe a projector or a screen or a laptop or, or a Zoom subscription or, or a room somewhere or, you know, or a car to get to people's houses. That's our fishing equipment, right? And you could probably add to this list. But let me talk a little bit about a bi the Bible itself uh, because increasingly I see people using versions of the Bible that if they were to use that in a Bible study, it might be problematic. So um, I'm not one of those that thinks that somehow you're going to be deficient if you only use one version or the other. But I do believe strongly that it's important to be careful what you use in your Bible study. If you're grounded in the truth and so forth, you know, a few issues here and there and and just about any version, is, I don't think it's gonna cause you any harm, but you're definitely gonna encounter problems uh, when you're doing doctrinal Bible studies with people. And let me show you a few examples. Um, Revelation 13, 17, and the King James version says, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, what is a commonly held view about what is the mark of the beast? Six, six, six. Exactly. All right. Now, does this text say that the mark is the same thing as the number? No. No, it does not. It says that no man can buy or sell unless you have the mark or the name or the number of his name. Now, notice the New King James Version says the same thing. No problem with either version. Let's take a look at another version, the NIV. It says, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, is that a significant change in the meaning of the, of the text? Yeah. yeah, certainly it is. There, you know, if you were to do a Bible study out of the NIV and you're trying to teach somebody that the mark is something other than 666, you're going to have a difficulty if you're using this version of the Bible. Uh, what about the NASB? He either provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. So not exactly the same thing as the NIV, but it kind of leans in the same direction. Well, and then uh, the NRSV says, so that no one can buy or sell who does not have the mark, that is the name of the beast or the number of his name. So once again, the NRSV, the NASB, the NIV, they all seem to um, uh, not just imply, but directly say that the mark is 666. Well, let's take a look at some others. Ephesians 1.13. In him, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, here the Holy Spirit is the sealer, right? It's the agency by which God does the sealing. But notice the change here in the NIV. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now, if you're using the NIV and you're trying to teach somebody that the seal is something else, that the seal is found in the Sabbath, it's found in the fourth commandment, but then you come across this text, is that going to create an issue for you? Well, it very well could. So once again, I, I think it's important, the version that you're using. Let's look at a few other examples in case you're not yet convinced. Ephesians 2.15 having abolished in his flesh the enmity as the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. So here, what is it that was abolished? Well, it's the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Well, that's very clearly referring to the ceremonial law. But notice in the NIV, the same passage, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, 
thus making peace. So here, what was abolished, if you have a bias to see that as being the moral law, you're not gonna see it otherwise in this text in the NIV. Whereas it's pretty clear that it's otherwise in Ephesians 2.15 from the New King James Version or from the King James Version. What about Acts 20 verse seven? Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his passage until midnight. Well, this is an important text that you're covering uh, if you, if you're, let's say you've just covered the Sabbath with uh, somebody you're studying the Bible with, and now you're going through all the texts that, uh, that mention the first day of the week. So you go through this with the New King James Version. It, it's easy to, to explain that, well, this is, you know, this was Saturday night. And the fact that they were eating bread doesn't necessarily mean that they were having communion. Um, but if you, read it in the uh, New Living Translation, it says that they were having communion. On the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. This is a little more problematic uh, because it's reinforcing, uh, you know, what people had previously been taught this text means. Second Corinthians 3.18, another example. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And here in the NIV, it says that we're transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Well, I don't know, as I read that, it kind of sounds like it's making Jesus and the Holy Spirit the same being. So for somebody that doesn't believe in the Trinity, you might have some problems studying out of the NIV. How about Job 1.6? If you're speaking the origin of of sin, or you're talking about how Christ claims to be the ruler of this planet, or, uh, or uh, you know, or how there's other worlds out there that are unfallen, or you know, any of those subjects that you're on. Let's say you 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 come across Job one six. It says, "Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them." Well, notice how that's translated in NIV. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. Um, that's kind of kind of a different slant on it. Doesn't you can't you really use that text to support any of those subjects we mentioned. First Corinthians 8, 4. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered by idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no no other God but one. And then here in the NASB, it says. Uh, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world. Now, why would that, <laughs> why would they choose to translate that text in that way? The NASB is, I'm pretty sure I checked all the other translations. I think it was the only one I found that translated it this way, uh, but I, I can't be certain. Uh, my recollection is not that strong. Um, but why would the NSB, you think, why would the bias of the translators result in them choosing to use the words in this way? Go ahead and unmute yourself if you want to share. I don't want to be offensive to a certain church that recognize Ida in their liturgy. Yeah, the same organization that uh, took the commandment about not worshiping images is the one who has, has produced this particular translation. And while this translation actually is a great translation, it's uh, probably one of the most accurate of the, of the uh, of more recent translations. Uh, but still in all, you can see a certain bias coming in and that particular passage, Mark 7, 19, another example, because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And in the NIV, it says, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. And the NASB says it the same way, thus he declared all foods clean. John 5, 4, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, do you think that this pool of Bethesda could be stirred by an angel of God? Would God do something like that that would create in people trampling over each other and 
only the strongest would prevail. That doesn't sound like something God would do, but yet the NASB says, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Um, hmm. I have a problem with that. So anyway, uh, that's my take on translations. Um, my recommendation is to use the King James Version, or probably better yet, the New King James Version. Hey, Steve. Um, yes, sir. Let me just, uh, can I just share one I ran into uh, last night in a Bible study? This is uh, be great. Re Revelation, you know, Revelation 12, 17, uh, you know, the dragon was wroth with the woman, went to make war with the women, the uh, remnant of her seed. Uh, and then the, the in Revelation 13, uh, verse 1, the King James Version says, and I, John, the revelator, stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven horns, okay? Now, in the NIV, it says, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. So I had to do a little <laughs> explaining with that one. <laughs> I never noticed that difference. Yeah, King James says, I, John, was standing, and, and NIV says, the dragon was standing on the sand of the sea. Yeah. And the leverage off what you just said, if you are doing a study about the remnant um, throughout the Bible uh, with a focus on the end of time, you're not going to find the remnant even in Revelation 12, 17, except in the King James Version. All the rest of them say the, you know, the rest of her offspring or something like that. Oh, uh, one more thing I was going to say about the Bible that you use. I highly recommend that you not use an E.G. White study Bible or any one of our other denominational uh, prophecy study Bibles. And the reason for that is because you'll find a lot of people that you study with, uh, when they have a question, they'll often go to some note, uh, some, uh, uh, some study note that's in the Bible. And there's a tendency for that, for them to treat that as inspired, uh, inspired work. And so if you're also using a study Bible, uh, I think you're going to have a harder time uh, emphasizing that, well, let's just let the Bible uh, speak for itself and remember that uh, these commentaries, they're not inspired. They're, they're men that we hope they were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but unless we do a great deal of study about their life and the product of their work, uh, how would we know? And many times in those, uh, in those study guides, you don't even know who wrote something. Um, so my advice is to not use those. And then one other thing, definitely do not use the clear word Bible. Um, the, the author of the Bible, uh, Jack Blanco, uh, is clearly worried about people considering that a Bible and not a collection of notes on the Bible. And we definitely don't want to p have people think that we have to use our own translation of the Bible to be able to support our belief system. And that's why I don't, I don't really care what anybody else uses when they're studying. I never try to get them to use the same version as that I do. Uh, I just ask them to bring their Bible, read out of their Bible. But I make sure that the version that I'm using has one that's not going to create issues for me. Does anybody have any questions about that? Inez has her hand up. Go ahead. I have Actually, he just answered it because I was just going to ask him, well, you know, there's a difference between me doing a Bible study and Elder Evans doing a Bible study. So I was just going to ask, well, if I'm using the New King James or the King James version, and there's something there that I can't quite 100% give an explanation for, if someone questions, then, you know, what happens there? But you just said to have them bring their own Bible. But if I'm reading from my Bible and they see something different, in their Bible, then what happens there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and what I would just reiterate is that uh, it's unrealistic to expect that you're always gonna have the answer to any question okay. uh, at, the, at the time that they ask the question. Okay. There's gonna be lots of times, especially as you're gaining experience that you're gonna have to say, you know what? I've never thought about that that way. And I don't want to give you an incomplete answer. So do you mind if, if I study that? And then let's restudy that question next, next week. And hopefully okay. I'll be better prepared. Got it. 
Don't you think people would accept that as your answer? Yes, they would. Mm -hmm. They do. Now be true to your word. Don't come back the next week and then and then forget forget and have to tell them, well, you know, I forgot about that. <laughs> okay. Um, if you say that you're going to study it next week, then do it. And and you'll find that God will use that to strengthen your own understanding. Uh, the people that you study with are going to have some of them will be questions that will be very easy for you to answer. Um, some will have questions that are very deep. You know, you're going to have all kinds of different questions. Um, but most of the time you'll find that you, you know the answer, but the best way to answer them is just take them back to the Bible. Let the Bible explain itself. If they okay. don't see something in a particular passage, don't hang your hat on that passage. Don't try to defend uh, how you explain that passage. Just take them to another one. And I've found that nine times out of 10, if they find out that you're, you're, you know, you have other passages, they'll begin to trust what you say about the first in your first explanation. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Steve, okay. I, yeah. I listened to um, a lecture on uh, different versions of the Bible in Arise. And I'm going to put in the chat a, there's a PDF, a book that you can read free online. It's a PDF on the, on versions mm -hmm. and what happened. And, and it, it talks about the different um, texts that are the, what do they call them? The textus, the, the original documents of the Bible. So if you want to study any more on this as to why some Bibles have um, more verses than, than like the King James version does. And they're diff they're translating it off of different old manuscripts. But anyway, th I'm putting it in the, the chat. Here's a, a, if you really want to study that out uh, more, it's a free book that you can read online. And, and by the way, I, I would not, this, this, uh, these comments I'm making about the version, they just apply to you as the teacher. I would not engage in any kind of discussion or especially controversies with anybody about the Bible version they choose to study from. I studied with a guy one time that was intent upon using, I don't remember, recall the name of the version, but it's the version that's used by uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. And when we came to the idea that Jesus pre-existed uh, his birth here, and he challenged me on that. And I said, well, let me, let me show you some things. And he says, no, I want you to show you, uh, I want you to show it to me from my Bible. Well, when he said that, my heart sank because I figured there's no way I'm going to be able to show it from his Bible. I'm sure that they've altered the passages uh, that I would use to prove that. But I just said a quick prayer. And so I set about sh taking him to the texts that I wanted to show him in his Bible and he accepted it. And I was surprised to find that it was easy to prove right out of, right out of that Bible. Yes, so, you proved that Jesus is Jehovah in the Jehovah Witness Bible. I, I've, yeah. I have a handout on that. Interesting. I um, didn't know that until that happened. Uh, greetings all, this is Bert. Um, also, um, we, we wanna point out uh, also the middle concordance in uh, the versions of the Bible that sometimes the cross references to other texts, um, we need to you know, study up on that. And there's one in particular in the King James, King James version of the Holman's Bible. It's uh, Revelation one verse 10. It, it reads, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet. Now in the concordance section, it, re uh, it references two texts. Um, one is Acts 27. So if someone would turn to that and read Acts 20 verse seven, and if someone else would turn to John 20 verse 26, this is just a short exercise, but if someone would volunteer to read either one of those two texts in reference to Revelation 1.10. And this is just an exercise so we can see how the concordance also, we need to be familiar with versions that uh, reference the text that we may be using in a study. 
you know, Bert, um, I, I hear you because I'm looking up on Acts 2, 20, verse 7, and it says upon the first day of the week. Uh, they, I've had, I've seen even versions that say I was in the Lord's, I was in the spirit on Sunday. I've had, I've seen versions that actually say that. Wow. So, okay. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, we have to be very careful. And this is a King James version that, that is being used. It's called the rainbow study Bible. And, um, this particular passage was brought out. It was a study being done on three ABN, um, one of the pastors was bringing this out. And so it's just another way for us to see that every time we are doing a study, we need to study up before we go to the, to the presentation because there's little things that could trip us up, you know, um, trying to get a you know, response or conviction from someone and, and they've studied up you know, on the matter just a, a little ahead of time especially on something that's so clear to us, but to others, um, they may use it, you know, to weigh in and, and kind of trench in on what, what they already believe. Uh, thanks for sharing that. I appreciate that. So we, we move from knowledge of fishing equipment to next, what about a knowledge of the fish? Uh, what do fish like to eat? And when do they eat? And where do they hide? And what are they attracted to? And what do they need? So if we think about how a fisherman, what is necessary for a fisherman to catch fish, we can apply um, that, that allegory or is it a simile? Uh, I always get those mixed up, but we can apply, I'll, I'll use the word allegory. We can apply that allegory um, very uh, fine-tunedly to the idea of soul, soul winning. Um, you know, if, if the people that you are uh, trying to win, um, if you don't know anything about them, it's going to be much more difficult to win them to Christ. But if you know, you know, what, what they're interested in, uh, where they're at, um, how they, what they do to hide from Christians, uh, what they're attracted to, what they need, um, that's going to help you a lot. And then fishing strategy and technique. You fish from the boat or from the shore? Uh, what time of day to fish? What type of bait? Uh, how uh, deep in the water do you allow the bait to, to, to rest? Uh, how do you set the hook? How do you land the fish? Um, so I think that's, I think these are really useful metaphors, knowledge of fish and then strategy and technique. And in terms of farming, um, this is a great, metaphor to use in terms of building your cycle of evangelism in your church. Uh, there's, uh, when we were doing planning at Amazing Facts, we often would uh, ask people when they come up with an idea that I'd say, well, do you see that as uh, seed sowing or as, as reaping? Uh, because that helped to uh, categorize it and put it into the proper uh, frame of reference. Uh, so as we think about the activities that we're trying to do, uh, I think it's helpful for us to think about that because it also helps us to, uh, to analyze who we're uh, addressing ourselves to, you know, because seed sowing, that's something you do for people that are a little lower on the number scale, whereas reaping, you're doing that for people that are high up on the number scale, right? So some sowing things would be preparing the soil, sowing the seed, watering, weeding, cultivating, reaping would be, you, you wait until the fruit is ripe to do that, but you wanna bring in the harvest. That's the whole objective. And then you need to protect the harvest. And that's uh, discipling. That's things like making sure that people that are newly baptized, making sure that they're not sitting all by themselves at potluck, making sure that they're surrounded by friends uh, people have a tendency to get into a certain social network that they're comfortable with, and new people um, often feel lonely in church. And if you think about it, oftentimes people have given up their entire social network to become a Seventh-day Adventist. And so if we're not surrounding them with love, uh, we're really, we're, you know, the likelihood is that they're not going to stay in the church. We need to make sure that they have a social network in the, in the church, that they have friends, that they're getting invited out, that they're getting invited to participate in activities. 
um, that's protecting the harvest. Um, the other thing that I that that kind of helps me uh, to avoid um, trying to defend an interpretation of a certain scripture too much is to be thinking of scriptures as lining up like fence posts. If you look at that dot and say you're looking down from above and that's a fence post in the ground, if you have these two fence posts, do you know where the fence is going? Well, you'd be wrong to try to interpret it based upon that because there is the next fence post. In fact, if you put a bunch of other fence posts up, then you kind of know where the fence line is, right? Well, you have one text that seems out of line with the others. But if you study all the others and then go back to the one that seems out of line, usually by understanding the others, you realize that the other really isn't in disagreement. Uh, David L. Cooper, way back in 1850, said, when the plain sense of scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word at its primary literal meaning. Ellen White in Great Controversy said in 598, the language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning, unless a symbol or figure is employed. And Isaiah 28 verse 10 says, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. In our Western mind, we kind of uh, have come to expect that if you want to know about the Holy Spirit, you go into the table of contents and you find the chapter on the Holy Spirit. And you read what that chapter says, and now you understand the Holy Spirit. But the Bible isn't that way. For you to understand the Holy Spirit, you have to read the Bible from one end to the other. And I think that's what this passage is saying in Isaiah 28.10 precept you build one precept upon another precept and then that precept is used to build up another precept you take a line here and then another line but you build this you build them together and then that next line you build another line upon that you lo learn a little here and this part of the past and this part of the bible and, and a little bit more somewhere else uh, according to the Westminster Confession of Faith, the infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, it must be searched and known by other places in the Scripture that speak more plainly. So let the Bible interpret itself. We need to be careful that we're not filling the conversation with our own words. We need to remember that our words have no power, but God's words have all the power. And we're just there as his agent. So it's not for us to try to define what God is saying. Uh, but some people need some help in knowing uh, where to go to find the answers. And, and we can do that for them. The other um, suggestion is to make sure that your Bible study has a conclusion. Teaching without a conclusion is like fishing without a hook. The fisherman may have the best lure and equipment and be a skilled fisherman, yet if he doesn't have a hook, he can't catch a fish. If teaching is for decisions, then the conclusion should be designed to have pup pupils make a decision. So let's say we're on a Bible study where we're not really, we're not really going into any testing truth. Um, do we then skip having a decision made at the end of that Bible study? No, people can still uh, make some, some kind of commitment related to anything that you're teaching. And these little decisions then are important because little decisions uh, lead to big decisions. Psalms 33, 6 and 9, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. There's power in the word of God. Jesus opened his mouth. And as his tongue was moving, the sun formed. And it could do no otherwise. The power was in the word. When God spoke the words to the prophets, now they didn't transcribe them word for word, but they spoke the thoughts and the prophets put them into their own words. That's God's word. And we need to handle it with reverence because uh, and realize that 
there's power in the word to fulfill the very words that God spoke a long time ago. Isaiah 55, 11 says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. What if you study for some, with somebody for a year and maybe they initially agree with some testing truths, but later on they turn from it. How are you to understand that in the light of Isaiah 55, 11? God says, his word will not return unto him void. Anybody? Well, um, God determines the time of reaping. So we might just be sowing the seed somebody else has to water. Ah, very, very, very good point. Let's take it to the next notch, though. Let's say it's somebody that you spend a lot of time with and they ultimately aren't in the kingdom. And how are we to understand God's promise that his word would not return unto him void? Maybe just preach for a witness. Yeah, if, if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're doing is applying it to somebody like, like uh, Noah. When Noah is preaching God's word, did it return to God void? No. no, it was still giving the warning. It had an effect upon people. God's word, God is saying here, it shall have an effect. His word will always, always, always either harden a heart or soften a heart. Now we pray for the soft heart, but sometimes it will harden a heart but it still has an effect. It will always have an effect. And remember that we're not responsible for the results. We're only responsible for doing what God has called us to do. He's, he takes responsibility for the results. And sometimes he's gonna send us to people and we're gonna spend a lot of time on people that God knows they're not gonna accept it. Stephen? Yeah, I also think of um, uh, Saul, uh, the Apostle Paul, who uh, was impacted by the witness of Stephen as he was getting stoned and what impact it had on him later down later on down the road. Exactly. And and Paul made the point, too, about, you know, him sowing seed and Apollo, uh, Apollo um, reaping a, or vice versa, you know, that, that sometimes. The person that sows the seed is not the person that's going to reap it, right? Jesus told us that as well. Um, so that's a good point that uh, you guys are making. But I, 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 maybe this point only applies to me because uh, I at times got discouraged when people didn't accept something and thinking that somehow I failed or whatever, or that I wasn't being a good fruit inspector and I spent a lot of time on somebody that, you know, wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't a fruitful effort until I finally realized this concept. You're still doing God's work, whether you can see results to it or not. If you do what he says that he wants you to do, he will bless that work. And sometimes he's going to send you to warn somebody that he knows won't accept it, but that's still doing his work. What about the effect it has on you, the presenter, as well? Well, I think that's why he has, that's why he sees fit to give us successes sometimes, because in our human weakness, sometimes we need to see that. But that helps us to understand how, how strong Noah was to not have a single convert, and yet faithfully, for 120 years, he faithfully preached. The power is in the word, according to the book, Education, page 126, the creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the word of God. This word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise accepted by the will, received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. So let's move on to another topic, Bible study ABCs. Um, 
The first one is present Jesus first. The second is reveal truth gradually. And the third is make regular appeals. Those are the Bible study ABCs. So what about presenting Jesus first? Jesus said in John 12, 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. The Desire of Ages, page 826, says the wonderful love of Christ will melt and subdue hearts when the mere reiteration of doctrine would accomplish nothing. I think this is a challenge to all of us. You know, Ellen White frequently said to the early uh, uh, Adventist preachers that everything needs to be bathed in the light of the cross. Everything needs to be enlightened in the love of Christ. Uh, the love of Christ. If we say to somebody, what I'm offering you is Jesus, the one who can um, handle the stress in your life. Before I leave today, may I pray with you? Now, if that's our invitation to somebody, is that presenting Christ first? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. So we always need to remember in whatever Bible study we're presenting to bathe it in the light uh, of the cross. Uh, the second Bible study ABC is to reveal truth gradually. Um, Proverbs 4.18 uh, presents this, this idea, this concept of the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. So there's not a light that just suddenly turns on because that would blind us. Bright light blinds, especially when somebody is accustomed to darkness. Eyes adjust to light progressively until bright light can be tolerated. The assimilation of many new ideas at once knocks people off their balance. This is called dissonance. It's the inability to make things fit together. The inability to kind of homogenize the whole thing and and to, and to correspond it to things that, that the person already knows to be true. You know, we all have a strong desire. We've been taught from infanthood that when we learn one thing, then when we get to the next thing that we're attempting to learn, we kind of make connections to the things we've learned in the past. And if you are shining a light on somebody and, and they see that something is in question and they go back, to look at what that hangs on and they realize that thing now is in question also, this really knocks them off their balance. And we have to be very patient and very loving and very kind with people as they go through that process. And sometimes that process results in the need for lots of repetition. Um, what I found is uh, a lot of people that I've taken through the, Dan clear through the Daniel study and then clear through the Revelation study, and then I take them through a topical Bible study and then I try to get them to go to a prophecy seminar or listen to it on, on DVD or something or other. And many times they've heard the whole message two or three times before they finally come to accept it. Some people embrace it right away. You know, it just varies in where the person is and how they process information. But we can do things to minimize this friction of disson dissonance by progressing step by step, making sure a person absorbs one thing thing before we go on to the next thing. And it helps uh, when, to harmonize the new idea with something the person already believes. But remember to always present every teaching through Jesus and make regular appeals. Those little decisions that you're calling for at the end of every single Bible study, those little decisions lead to the big decisions. So we should reveal truth gradually. Uh, look at information and decisions as a step-by-step -step process. Every step you provide new information, then you ask for a decision on that information. Take them to the next step, provide more information, ask for a decision on that information. Little decisions lead to big decisions, reveal truth gradually. So how do we structure a Bible study? Well, you know, there's no, this is not black and white. These are just my personal suggestions. In fact, Cindy, change the, <laughs> the time period on that on me when I sent it to her to edit because I originally had that as one hour per week. Uh, she always spends more time and she is a very successful and efficient um, 
uh, Bible instructor. So I have no criticism of what she's saying. Uh, it's just for me, um, what I've found is that uh, with the with the kind of people I've usually studied with in the past, they have, you know, they have busy lives. And if they know that you're taking up a lot of their time, they're more tempted to cancel the Bible study. Um, so, Cindy, you want to give your argument for the one and a half to two hours? Well, I usually study with women. I don't usually study with men. And women like to socialize and share. And they like to um, get to know each other, especially as a group. And even if it's just one-on-one, -on -one, I try to take time with the person I'm studying with to get to know them well. Um, I think that's vital because then you learn things about them you might not know and it's helpful in reaching their needs as you go through the study. See, that's not my strong point. I tend to come in and spend three or four minutes with small talk and then launch right into the Bible study. And, and what I want to make sure is I leave them thinking about a text and not leave them thinking about some social interaction or something that I've said or whatever. So I like to end with a text and then a prayer and then I, you know, I quickly leave the person's home. Um, well, we're so all... we have different we have different techniques and, and we have to fight in yeah. our own armor. Yes. So. I was going to say the same that we're all different. And... Now, we both tend to just do one lesson per week. I know some people, they'll do whatever the person is willing to do, but I feel like while early on in the lessons, people may be able to tolerate more than one lesson per week, when you get to difficult things for them to swallow, uh, you're gonna be going too fast, I believe, if you're going more than one lesson a week. So my advice, one lesson a week, let the student read from their own Bible. Don't try to convince them to use a certain version and have them look up texts. Um, I actually often, uh, in the first couple of lessons, I, like right now, I'm, I'm studying with a guy uh, up in New Jersey over, over uh, GoToMeeting. And when we first started, it took him forever to find texts. So at the end of like the third lesson, I said, hey, I've got a, uh, an assignment for you, Mike. Do you mind if I give you an assignment? He says, no, sh go, uh, go ahead. I said, by next week, I'd like you to have learned the books of the Old Testament in order. And then the following week, I'm gonna assign you to learn the New Testament books. He said, okay, I'll do that. It was amazing. He, he did it within one week. He had the Old Testament books uh, all memorized in order and it greatly sped up our Bible study because he could find texts and I wasn't tempted then to put all the texts on the screen or, or, to, uh, or to read them for him or whatever. I, I, don't, I think it's really important for people to find the text in their own Bible and read them, to, uh, read them in the Bible study. And then uh, begin the lesson by reviewing and asking questions about the previous study. Uh, ask questions. If you're going to ask a question, like I think it's a good teaching strategy to ask questions. But if you ask a question, go to the Bible for the answer. Um, and then salt the oats. You can't lead a horse to water, but you can salt the oats. I watched my daughter one time trying to get her horse into a trailer and she was really struggling. And I was a little bit fearful because I thought, you know, if that horse uh, suddenly responds and jumps into the trailer, it could crush her and kill her. And so I said, I said, uh, Hannah, let me try. So, you know, I figured it might take some, uh, you know, a lot of strength to pull the horse into the trailer. Well, there's no pulling a horse into a trailer. If that horse doesn't want to go into the trailer. You could hook a block and tackle up to him to get him in. The only way you're going to do it, you're not going to do it in your own strength. Same way with, uh, I think the saying, you can't lead, a, uh, you can't, What's the saying? You can't lead a horse to water. Knife. You can't make a, I can't lead a, you can't, you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make him drink. Oh, that's, yeah, that's the same. But you can salt the oats. If you put salt in his oats, that's going to make him want to drink, right? Well, the idea is that at the end of every study, salt the oats for the next study. Tell people a little bit about what's, what they're going to learn in the next study and how much they're going to enjoy it. So they're less uh, tempted to cancel it salt the oats, and then open and close with prayer. And I usually ask the other person to do one of the prayers 
sometimes both prayers, and then maybe I'll do the other prayer. Um, and then I highly recommend Daniel and Revelation format Bible studies. And I'll tell you the reason why. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I want to teach people about God's love. Well, that's great. And that's a good place to start if somebody is not a Christian. But if you're studying with a fellow Christian, you know, all churches teach that. The thing that, that they're going to eat up from you is the stuff that they've never studied before. And churches just aren't, most churches just are not studying prophecy. So when people get involved in Daniel and Revelation, it's like they're tasting something they've never tasted before and it's delicious to them and they love it and they enjoy the studies so much. Prophets and Kings recommends it in page 547. As we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies recorded by Daniel demand our special attention as they relate to the very time we are living in. With them should be linked the teachings of the last book of the New Testament scriptures. So Daniel and Revelation should be taught together. The book Education, page 191, says the book of Revelation in connection with the book of Daniel especially demands study. Let every God-fearing teacher consider how most clearly to comprehend and to present the gospel that our Savior came in person to make known to his servant John. And Testimonies to Ministers says when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. And that applies not only to the people that are that we're trying to teach to, but it applies to us probably more so. Um, and then one thing will certainly be understood from the study of Revelation, that the connection between God and his people is close and decided. These two books should be carefully studied. Read Revelation in connection with Daniel. Teach these things. That's a strong recommendation. All right, now in the interest of time, I'm gonna just skip all this stuff. Steve, don't, don't some... skip. Steve, don't skip it. See, we'll just... there's only six minutes, and I think well, what okay. is behind this is more important. Well, we can do it next week. All right. I don't think you should rush through this, honey. All right, Daniel one. We kind of covered this already because I asked before what is the subject. Well, most of us kind of instantly say, well, it's about, it's about uh, uh, health reform. But if we're doing a Daniel and Revelation Bible study and if Daniel is the first lesson we're teaching, we definitely don't want to get into, into diet and health reform on the very first study. So what other subject is there? Well, I would suggest how to make a connection to heaven, giving my heart to God. That's what Daniel did. That's what kept him uh, faithful to God. Daniel 1 verse 8 says that Daniel purposed in his heart they would not defile himself with the king's food. He purposed in his heart. Now that word purposed, if you look up the original Hebrew word, it's the same word that elsewhere in the same chapter is translated as gave. So Daniel purposed in his heart. You could say, well, Daniel gave his heart. And when we give our heart, that's how we establish our connection with heaven. In Daniel 2, part A, what's the subject? I would say it's how to stay connected with heaven because Daniel and his three friends, they went into a prayer meeting after they found out what the situation was that they were confronted with resulted in the king's edict that they die. So they, uh, they, uh, the prayer is the way we stay connected to heaven and we strengthen our connection. Uh, Daniel 2b, what's the subject? Well, how to establish and strengthen our faith. That's, that further strengthens our connection to heaven and we can do so through the study of prophecy. Daniel 3, what's the subject? Memorizing and claiming God's promises. Those three Hebrew boys, when they said that, that uh, um, what were their words? Their exact words um, escapes me. It uh, says that they... They said from the hand, uh, yeah, God would save them from the hand of the king. They were quoting from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah said that specifically. That, that, he, that God would deliver them from the hand of the king. Uh, so they, they had memorized that promise and they were claiming that promise. Daniel 4, what's the subject? Asking for and living in the spirit. Daniel 5, what's the subject? Acting immediately on truth. Daniel 6, what's the subject? Being sealed by God and used by him. Daniel 7, what's the subject? Allowing God to change me. Think about it. What was the papacy's reaction to being accused by the reformers of, of, uh, of being the Antichrist? 
Well, they attempted to change the interpretation of the scriptures. They attempted to change the very time in the prophecy that pointed uh, to them, the very, the very, one of the very criteria they tried to change. They put it in the past or they put it in the future. Um, so, you know, the application there is you, in that lesson is, well, what would you do if somebody accused you of uh, trying to reinterpret scripture or, or whatever? Um, so you can take the lesson out of that, allowing God to change me. This is the way that you can take every single one of your Bible studies and make it into a personal application to which you can then ask the person to make a commitment about. Uh, going on, 7b, sending my sins to judgment now. Daniel 8, praying for patience and persistence. Daniel 9, restoring my covenant experience with God. Daniel 10, persistent prayer while trusting God. Daniel 11, trusting God to handle my life's details. Daniel 12, discerning God's appointments in what seems like a disappointment. And there, in that lesson, you're really, you're really beginning to lay the foundation for them understanding the whole concept of a remnant people that have a special message uh, before the end of, before the close of Earth's history. <clears throat> so, as we uh, go through this, sometimes you're going to encounter somebody that has never given themselves to Jesus. And Steve, you, when you identify that, you have the opportunity to do so. Yeah? It's 7.30 and I, I need to ask permission if they want to continue or if we can, can we can continue this next week. Because I also okay. have some closing remarks and want to share a few things and ask who can give their testimony for next week. So I think this would be great if you just started here next week. Okay, we can do that. There's only about 10 or 15 slides left so that would probably take point. about 10 minutes or so well, let's let's just wait okay. if you don't mind okay well i wanted to um share tonight that you know i i just don't want steve to rush through this material because i think it's very important and um i want to i want us to have a, a you know an opportunity to process well, that's a lot of information he gave you tonight and early when we first began this evening i said next week would be the last one but i don't think that will be i think we will need 10 nights i thought we might could finish it i didn't know how it would go tonight so let's just plan on two more weeks so we have a total of 10 classes next week i'll have steve continue uh, his segment next week is going to be very important how to lead someone to jesus and I don't want to rush through that. That is something we all need to know how to do and feel comfortable with it. And um, so he's going to share that next week. Then um, I, I, there, I'm going to do a few more things in um, uh, what, what God is calling us to do and on discipleship. So I think we are going to need two more weeks. And, you know, because God is, God is, uh, calling us out to to be leaders and to start doing these Bible studies with people. And I want you prepared and I want you to know that if you have any questions, even after we complete the 10 weeks, Steve and I are here for you. We are here for you. And I'm we're going to tape uh, record the Daniel and Revelation lessons that I gave you access to on my Dropbox so that you can go and i haven't started it yet last, last month was a blur get helping my daughter move so we're going to get these taped so that you if you decide to use that powerpoint and you may be like i don't know how to teach this because uh, you know it's kind of hard to to, to uh, teach somebody else's um powerpoint but if you will go to my our recorded lesson we're going to do where we will teach it on there and just record it for the teacher not for you to share with someone else but for you to go through it if you feel you need that extra uh training and, and daniel and revelation if you want to use the keys to the kingdom and so we're going to do that as a project we have to do and um as i as we record it i will give you the the links so that you can go through daniel and revelation go through the powerpoint we shared of keys to the kingdom um and also, I want to ask who 
who wants to give their testimony next week. And I would love to, to see if, if you haven't done it yet, go ahead and say, we'll schedule for the, the following week as well. Who, who has not given their testimony yet and would like to do next week. Okay, Shauna. All right, great. Shauna will do next week. Anyone else that would like to? No? No takers? How about two weeks from tonight? Any takers for doing their testimony then? Okay, Mickey. Okay. Anyone Cindy, else? If you, I'll do mine two weeks from then as okay, well. Okay, Michelle. All right, thank you. And I want to apologize. Michelle showed me that I had a typo in the email I sent out earlier today that the class was at seven. And I deeply apologize for that. I don't know why I did that. It just, I don't know. It just escaped me. Normal, usually meetings are at seven, I guess. I don't know. But I, um, I'm so sorry. But if this is recorded. So you did, you can go back and hear what you missed if you came in late. I'm really sorry about that. So normally, yes, it, it's six o'clock. I, I don't know why I put seven. Please forgive me. So next week, Shauna and Melissa, because Melissa was going to do it tonight, but she couldn't. So I think Melissa will do it next week. And then Mickey and Mich Michelle. And is there anyone else here that hasn't shared that, that wants to? Let me see, I have. Okay, Bert, you said two weeks. Okay, great. I got your, I got your chat message, okay. This is my favorite part of our get together is hearing the testimonies. Me too. They just such a strong encouragement. Yeah, I think it helps us to to get to know each other better and to see what God has done. It's so encouraging to see what God has done in other people's lives. So exciting to hear. Okay, so next week, six o'clock. <laughs> sorry, six o'clock. Next week we will uh, continue. And um, I pray that you all have a blessed week. You're all in my, our prayers. I just want you to know we're praying for all of you. Does anyone have a question that we didn't cover in our question about something or a testimony to share? Go ahead and unmute yourself if you do. No questions? Okay. Great. Um, so any volunteer for closing prayer? If not, I will go ahead and do so. Okay, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you love us, you care for each and every single one of us, that you know how many hairs are upon our head. And Lord, that changes on a daily basis. It changes every time we swipe our hands through our hair. Father, I thank you that you know us so intimately. Lord, we pray that we can know you that intimately, that we can draw close to you as you draw close to us. And then infuse us with your spirit and give us wisdom, give us divine appointments that we can share this love with others. Prepare us, Father, um, as we go forward in faith to share your love and the message that you've given to us to share with the world. We love you and we come in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.